from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. A decade of big data investments combined with cloud scale, the rise of much more cost-effective processing power, and the introduction of advanced tooling has catapulted machine intelligence to the forefront of technology investments. No matter what job you have, your operation will be AI powered within five years and machines may actually even be doing your job. Artificial intelligence is being infused into applications, infrastructure, equipment, and virtually every aspect of our lives. AI is proving to be extremely helpful at things like controlling vehicles, spe speeding up medical diagnoses, processing language, advancing science, and generally raising the stakes on what it means to apply technology for business advantage. But business value realization has been a challenge for most organizations due to lack of skills, complexity of programming models, immature technology integration, sizable upfront investments, ethical concerns, and lack of business alignment. Mastering AI technology will not be a requirement for success in our view. However, figuring out how and where to apply AI to your business will be crucial. That means understanding the business case, picking the right technology partner, experimenting in bite-sized chunks, and quickly identifying winners to double down on from an investment standpoint. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we update you on the state of AI and what it means for the competition. And to do so, we invite into our studios, Andy Tarai of Constellation Research. Andy covers AI deeply. He knows the players, he knows the pitfalls of AI investment, and he's a collaborator. Andy, great to have you on the program. Thanks for coming into our CUBE studios. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Okay, let's set the table with a premise and a series of assertions we want to test with Andy. I'm going to lay them out and then Andy, I'd love for you to comment. So first of all, according to McKinsey, AI adoption has more than doubled since 2017, but only 10% of organizations report seeing significant ROI. That's a BCG and MIT study. And part of that challenge of AI is it requires data, it requires good data, data proficiency, which is not trivial as you know. Firms that can master both data and AI, we believe are going to have a competitive advantage this decade. Hyperscalers, as we show you, dominate AI and ML. We'll show you some data on that. And having said that, there's plenty of room for specialists. They need to partner with the cloud vendors for go-to-market productivity. And finally, organizations increasingly have to put data and AI at the center of their enterprises. And to do that, most are going to rely on vendor R&D to leverage AI and ML. In other words, Andy, they're going to buy it and apply it as opposed to build it. What are your thoughts on that setup and that premise? Yeah, I, I, I see that a lot happening in the field, right? So, um, <clears throat> Um, first of all, the 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 only ten percent of realizing a return on investment. That's so true because <clears throat> we we talked about this earlier. The most companies are still in the innovation cycle, so they're trying to innovate and see what they can do to apply. A lot of these times, when you look at the solutions, what they come up with, or the models they create, the experimentation they do, most times they don't even have a good business case to solve. Right, so they just experiment and then they figure it out. Oh my God, this model is working. Can we do something to solve it? So it's like you you found a hammer and then you're trying to find the nail kind of thing, right? That never because it's cool or whatever it is. <laughs> it is right. right? So um, so that's why you know I always advise you know when they come to me and ask me things like, hey, you know, what's the right way to do it? What is the secret sauce? And you know, we talked about this. The first thing I tell them is find out what is the business case that's having the most amount of problems that, that can be solved using some of the AI use cases, right? Not all of them can be solved. If you, even after you experiment, do the whole name, yeah, spend a, a millions of dollars on that, right? And then later on, you making efficient only by saving maybe 50,000 for the company or 100,000 for the company. Is it really even worth the experiment, mm. right? So you got you to gotta start with the saying that, you know, where's the wastage is happening? Where's the need? Where's the, what's the business use case? It doesn't have to be about cost efficient and saving money in the existing process. It could be a new thing. You want to bring in a new revenue stream. But, you know, figure out what is a business use case, how much money potentially I can make off of that, the same way that startups go after, yeah. right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. All right, let's take a look at where ML and AI fit relative to the other hot sectors of the ETR data set. Mm -hmm. This XY graph shows net score or spending velocity on the vertical axis and presence in the survey, they call it sector perversion for, uh, for the October survey, the January surveys in the field. 
And that squiggly line on MLAI represents the progression since the January 21 survey. You can see the downward trajectory. And we position ML and AI relative to the other big four hot sectors or big three, including you know, AI, ML, AI is four, containers, cloud, and RPA. These have consistently performed above that magic 40% red dotted line for most of the past two years. Anything above 40% we think is highly elevated. And we've just included analytics and, and big data for context and, and relevant adjacentness, if you will. Now note that green arrow moving toward you know, the 40% mark on ML, AI. It, it, I got a glimpse of the January survey, which is in the field. It's got more than a thousand responses already. And it's trending up for the for the current survey. So, Andy, what do you make of this downward trajectory over the past seven quarters and, and the presumed uptick in in the coming uh, the coming months? So, one of the things you have to keep in mind is when the um, pandemic happened, it's about survival mode, right? Mm. So when, when somebody is in a survival mode, what happens? The luxury and the innovations get cut. That's what happens. And this is exactly what happened in this situation. So as you can see in the last seven quarters, which is almost dating back to close to pandemic, everybody was trying to keep their operations alive, especially digital operations. How do I keep the lights on? That's the most important thing for them. So while the number spent on AI ML is less overall, I still think the AI ML to spend to sort of like an employee experience or the IT ops, AI ops, ML ops, as we talked about, some of those areas actually went up. There are companies, we talked about it, you know, Atlassian had a lot of platform issues. Still, the amount of money people are spending on that is exorbitant simply because they, they are offering a solution that was not available otherwise. So there are companies out there, you know, you can take AOPS or incident management for that, for that um, matter, right? A uh, lot of companies have a digital incident, they don't know how to properly manage it. How do you find an incident and solve it immediately? That's all using AI ML. And some of those areas actually growing unbelievable, the companies in that area. So this is a really good point. If you, if, Ken, if you bring up that uh, chart again, what, what Andy's saying is a, a lot of the companies that in the ETR taxonomy that are doing things uh, with AI might not necessarily show up in a, in a granular fashion. And I think the other point I would make is these are still highly elevated numbers. If you put on like storage and servers, they would be yep. way, way down the list. And, you know, look, in the pandemic, we had to deal with work from home. We had to re-architect the network. We had to worry about security. So so that's those are really good points that, that you made there. Um, let's you know, unpack this a little bit and look at the ML AI sector in the ETR data and, and specifically look at the players and get Andy to comment on this. This chart here shows the same XY dimensions and it just lay, notes some of the players that, that are specifically have services and products that people spend money on uh, that CIOs and IT uh, uh, buyers can comment on. So the table insert shows how the companies are plotted it's net score and then the ends in the survey. And Andy, the hyperscalers are dominant. As you can see, you see Databricks there showing strong uh, as a specialist. And then you got a pack of six or seven in there. And then Oracle and IBM, one you know, of the big whales of, of yesteryear are in the mix. And, and to your point, you know, companies like Salesforce that you, you mentioned to me offline aren't in that mix, but they do a lot in AI. But what are your takeaways from that data? Um, if you could put the uh, slide back on, please. I want to make quick comments yeah, on a couple please. of those. So, the first one is, you know, um, it's surprising of the hyperscalers, right? As you and I talked about this earlier, AWS is more about uh, logo blocks. They we yeah. discussed that, right? We'll like what? You, like a SageMaker? As an we'll example. give you all the components. Yeah. What do you need? Whether it's an MLOps uh, uh, component or whether it's a you know the Code Whisper that we talked about, yeah. or 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 a overall platform or data or data whatever you want. They'll give you the blocks, and then you'll build things on top of it, right? But Google took a different way. Matter of fact, uh, if we did those numbers a few years ago, Google would have been number one because they did a lot of work with their you know, acquisition of you know, DeepMind and other things. They were, they were way ahead of the pack when it comes to AI for the longest time. Now, I think Microsoft's move of partnering and, and taking a huge competitor out with OpenAI is unbelievable. I mean, you saw that everybody is talking about chat, chat um, GPI, right, and, and the OpenAI tool. Uh, chat GPT rather. Um, remember as Warren Buffett is saying that, you know, when, when my 
laundry lady comes and talks to me about stock market, it's heated up. So that's how it's heated up. Everybody's using chat GPT. What that means is, at the end of the day, it's, they are creating, it's, it's still in beta, keep in mind. It's not fully Have you played with it a little bit? I, I have a little bit. I it's, have, it's, but... It's, 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 it's good and it's not good, you know what I mean? It's, look, so at the end of the day, you take the massive text of all the available text in the world today, mass them all, all together, and then you ask a question, it's going to basically search through that and figure it out and answer that back. Yes, it's good, but again, as we discussed, if there is no business use case of what problem you're going to solve, this is building a hype. But then eventually they'll figure out, you know, for example, your your all your, you know, the chats, online chats, you know, could be aided by your AI chatbots, which is already there, which is not there at that level. This could build help that, right? Mm -hmm. Or the other thing we talked about is one of the areas where I'm more concerned about is that, you know, it is able to produce equal enough of original text at the level that humans can produce. For example, ChatGPT or, or the equal of the, the large language transformer can help you write stories as if Shakespeare wrote it. Pretty close to it. It'll learn from that. So when it comes down to it, talk about you know creating messages, articles, blogs, especially during political seasons, not necessarily just in the U.S., but in any way for that matter, if people are able to produce at a mission speed and throw it at the consumers and confuse yeah. them, the elections can be won, the governments can be toppled. Because to your point about uh, chatbots, is chatbots have <coughs> obviously you know, reduced the number of you know, bodies that you need you know, to support chat, but they haven't solved the problem of you know, serving consumers. Most of the chatbots are of conditioned response, you know, which of the following best describes your problem. The current job box. Box. Yeah. And, you know, Hey, did we solve your problem? No, is the answer. So so that, that has some real potential. But if you could bring up that slide again, Ken. I, I mean, you've got this, the hyperscalers that are dominant. You talked about Google and Microsoft is ubiquitous. They seem to be dominant in every ETR category. But then you have these other specialists. How do those guys compete? And maybe you could even you know cite some of the guys that, that you know. Um, how do they compete with the hyperscalers? What's the key there for like a, a, a C3 AI or some of the others that are on there? So I've spoken with the, at least two of the C, C, CEOs of the, the smaller companies that you have on the list. One of the things they're they are worried about is that, you know, if they continue to operate independently without being part of a hyperscaler, uh, either the hyperscalers will develop something to compete against them full scale, or they'll become irrelevant because at the end of the day, look, cloud is dominant. Not many companies are going to do like AI modeling and training and deployment, the whole nine yards, by independent by themselves. They're going to depend on one of the clouds, right? So if they are already going to be in the cloud, by taking them out to come to you, it's going to be extreme mm -hmm. difficult issue to solve. So all these companies are going and saying, you know what? We need to be in, in hyperscalers. For example, you could have looked at uh, Data Robot recently. They made announcements with Google and AWS, and they're all over the yeah, place. So to you need it. to go where the customers are, right? All right, before we go on, I, I want to share some other data from ETR and why people adopt AI and get your feedback. So the data historically shows that feature breadth and technical capabilities were the main decision points for AI adoption historically. It's what says to me that it's like too much focus on technology. In your view, is that changing? Does it have to change? Will it change? Yes, simple answer is yes. So here's the thing, the data you're speaking from is from previous years. Yes. I can guarantee you, if you look at the latest data that's coming in now, those two will be a secondary and tertiary points. The number one would be about ROI. And how do I achieve, I've spent ton of money on all of my experiments. This is the same thing theme I'm seeing across I'm talking to everybody who's, who's spending money on AI. I spent so much money on it. When can I get it live in production? How much, how can I quickly get it? Because, you know, the board is breathing down their neck. You already spent this much of money. Show me something that's valuable. So the ROI is going to become, take it from me, I'm predicting this for 2023. That's going to become number one. Yeah, and if people focus on it, they'll figure it out. Okay, let's take a look at some of the top players, the ones, some of the names we just looked at, and double click on that and break down their spending profiles. So the chart, here shows the net score, how net score is calculated. So pay attention to the second set of bars that Databricks, who was pretty prominent on the previous chart, and we've annotated the colors. The lime green is we're bringing the platform in new. The forest green is we're going to spend 6% or more relative to last year. Uh, it, the, the gray is flat spending. The pinkish is 
we're going to our spending is going to be down on AI and ML six percent or worse. Uh, and the red is churn, so you don't want big red. Um, you subtract the reds from the greens, and you get net score, which is shown by those blue dots that you see there. So AWS has the highest net score and very little churn. I mean, single low single digit churn, but notably you see Databricks and Data Robot are next in line within Microsoft and Google. Also, they've got very low churn. Uh, Andy, what are your thoughts on, on this data? Um, so a couple of things that you know, stands out to me. Um, most of them are in line with my conversation with customers. A couple of them stood out to me on how bad IBM Watson is doing. If yeah, you look bring at the that back up if you would. Let's take a look at that. The, 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 look at the, IBM Watson is the far right, and the red, that bright red is churn. And, and you know, again, you want low red here. That well, is why shocking. do you think that is? Well, so, look, IBM has been in the forefront of innovating things for many, many years now, right? And over the course of years, we talked about this, they moved from a product innovation-centric company into more of a services company. And over the years, they were making, as at one point, you know that they were making about majority of that money from services. Mm -hmm. Now, things have changed. Arvind has taken over. He came from research. So he's doing a great job of you know, trying to reinvent themselves as a company. But it's going to have a long way to catch up. I mean, IBM Watson, if you think about it, that played, what, you know, Jeopardy and chess years ago, like 15 years ago? It was jaw-dropping when you first saw it. And then they weren't able to commercialize that. Yep. And you, you're making a good point. When Gerstner took over IBM, at the time, John Akers wanted to split the company up. He wanted to have a database company. He wanted to have a storage company. And because that's where the industry trend was. Gerstner said no. He came from Amex, right? He came from American Express. He said, no, we're going to have a single throat to choke for the customer. We're, they bought PwC for mm. relatively short money. I think it was $15 billion, Completely transformed. And I would argue saved IBM. But the trade-off was, it sort of took them out of product leadership. And so from Gerstner to Palmasano to Rometty, it was really a services led company. And I think Arvin's really bringing it back to a product company with strong consulting. I mean, that is one of the pillars. And so I think, I think, that's, that, that, I think they, they've, they've got a strong story in data and AI, they just got to, sort of bring it together and, and better. Bring that chart up one more time. I, I want to, the other, the other point is Oracle. Oracle sort of has the dominant lock-in for mission critical database and they're sort of applying AI there. But to your point, th they're really not an AI company in the sense that they're taking unstructured data and doing sort of new things with it. It's really about how to make Oracle better, right? Well, you got to remember Oracle is about, um, database for the structured data. So in the yesterday's world, they were a dominant database, but you know, if you were to start storing like videos and text and audio and other things, you know, and, and then start doing search of, you know, vector search and all that, Oracle is not necessarily the database company of choice. And, and their strongest thing being apps and building AI into the apps, they are kind of surviving in that area, but again, I wouldn't name them as an AI company, right? Yeah. But the other thing that, that surprised me in, in that list what you showed me is, Yes, AWS is, is, is number one. Bring that as back it should up be. if you would, Ken. AWS is number one, as you, it should be. Right. But what, what actually caught me by surprise is how Data Robot is holding. Mm. You know, I mean, look at that. The, the either a net new addition and or expansion, Data Robot seem to be doing equally well, even better than Microsoft and Google. That surprises me. Data Robots, and, and again, this is, this is a, a function of spending momentum. <clears throat> So remember from the previous chart that Microsoft and Google much, much larger than Data Robot, Data Robot more, more niche, but with spending velocity and has always had strong spending velocity, you know, despite some of the recent challenges, you know, organizational challenges. And then you see these other specialists, H2O.AI, Anaconda, Data IQ, a little bit, little bit of red showing there, C3 AI. Uh, but these again, to, to stress are the sort of specialists um, other than obviously the hyperscalers, these are the specialists in AI. All right, so we hit the bigger names in the sector. Now let's take a look at the emerging technology companies. And one of the gems of the ETR data set is the Emerging Technology Survey. It's called ETS. They used to just do it like twice a year. It's now run four times a year. I, I just discovered it kind of mid uh, 2022, and it's exclusively focused on private companies that are potential disruptors. They might be M&A candidates, and if they're, they've raised enough money, they could be acquirers of companies as well. So Databricks 
would be an example. They've made a number of investments in companies. Sneak would be another good example. Companies that are that are private, but they're buyers. They hope to go IPO at, at some point in time. So this chart here uh, shows the emerging companies in the ML AI sector of the ETR data set. So the dimensions are, this, uh, are similar. Their net sentiment on the Y axis and mind share on the X axis. Basically, basically the ETS study measures awareness on the, on the X axis and intent to do something with evaluate or, or implement or not uh, on that sort of vertical axis. So it's like net score on the vertical where negatives are subtracted from the positives. And again, mind share is vendor awareness. That's the horizontal axis. Now that inserted table shows net sentiment and, and the ends in the survey, which informs the position of the dots. And you'll notice we're plotting TensorFlow as well. We know that's not a company, but it's there for reference as open source tooling is an option for customers and ETR sometimes like to show that for, as a reference point. Now we've also drawn a line for Databricks to show how relatively dominant they've become in the past 10 ETS surveys and sort of mind share going back to late 2018. And you can see a dozen or so other emerging tech vendors. So Andy, I want you to, sh to share your thoughts on on these players, who were the ones to watch? Name some names. We'll bring that data back up as you as you comment. Um, so, data breaks, as you said, it's remember we talked about how Oracle is not necessarily the database of the choice. You know, so data breaks is kind of trying to solve some of the issue for AI ML workloads, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and the problem is also there is no one company that could solve all of the problems. For example, if you look at the names in here, some of them are database names, some of them are platform names, some of them are like MLOps companies, like you know, uh, Data <coughs> Robot, Domino, and others, and some of them are like uh, future based companies, like you know, the Tecton and, and stuff. So it's a you mix know. of those subsets. It's a mix so we'll of get, those companies. We'll talk to ETR about that. They'd be, they'd be interested in your input on how to make this more granular and you know these subsectors. You got Hugging Face in here, which I yeah, know which is, is NLP. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so your take, are these companies going to get acquired? Are they going to go IPO? Are they going to merge? Well, most go of them are going to get acquired. My prediction would be most of them will get acquired because look, at the end of the day, hyperscalers need these capabilities, right? So they're going to you know, either create their own, uh, AWS is very good at doing that, they have done a lot of those things, but the other ones, like for particularly Azure, they're going to look at it and say that, you know what, it's going to take time for me to build this. Why don't I just go and buy you, yeah. right? Or, or even the smaller players like Oracle or IBM Cloud, this still exist. They might even take a look at them, right? So at the end of the day, a lot of those companies are going to get acquired or merged with others. Yeah. So. All right, let's wrap with some final thoughts. I want to make some comments, Andy, and then ask you to, to dig in here. Look, despite the challenge of leveraging AI, you know, and I, and I can if you could bring up the next uh, next start, uh, chart. Uh, we're not repeating, we're not predicting the AI winter of the 1990s. Machine intelligence, it's a superpower that's going to permeate every aspect of the technology industry, AI and data strategies have to be connected. Leveraging first party data is going to, going to increase AI competitiveness and shorten time to value. Andy, I'd love your thoughts on that. I know you're, you've got some thoughts on, on governance and AI ethics. You know, we talked about, you know, chat GPT, deep fakes. What, help us unpack all of these trends. So there's so much information packed up there, right? Um, the AI and data strategy, that's, that's very, very, very important. Um, if you don't have a proper data, people don't realize that AI is your AIs and the models that you built on is predominantly based on the data what you have. It's not, AI cannot predict something that's going to happen without knowing what it is. It need to be trained. It need to understand what is it you're talking about. So 99% of the time, you got to have a good data for you to train. So this is where I mentioned to you. The problem is a lot of these companies can't afford to collect the real world data because it takes too long, it's too expensive. So a lot of these companies are trying to do the synthetic data way. It has its own set of issues because you can't use What's all that synthetic data? Explain that. Synthetic data is basically not a real world data, but it's a created or simulated data equivalent based on real data. It looks, feels, smells, tastes like a real data, but it's not exactly real data, right? Um, this is particularly useful in the financial and healthcare industry for world, so you don't have to... At the end of the day, if you have a real data about you on my medical history data, if you redact it, you can still reverse this. It's fairly easy, right?
right? Yeah, yeah. So by creating a synthetic data, there is no correlation between the real data and the synthetic data. So that's part of AI ethics and privacy and, okay. So, so the synthetic data, the issue with that is that when you're trying to commingle that with that, you can't create a models based on just on synthetic data because synthetic data, as I said, is artificial data. So basically you're creating artificial models. So you got to blend in properly that that blend is a problem and you know, how much of real data, how much of synthetic data you could use. You got to use judgment between efficiency, cost, and the time duration mm -hmm. stuff. So that's one. And risk. And the, yeah. And the risk involved with that. On the secondary issues, which we talked about, is that when you're creating a, you know, okay, you take a business use case, okay, you take about, you know, you invest in things, you build the whole thing out, and you're trying to, you know, put it out into the market. Most companies that I talk to don't have a proper governance in place. They don't have ethics standards in place. They don't worry about the biases in data. They just go on trying to solve a business case because west. that's what they start. It's a wild <laughs> west. And then at the end of the day, when they are close to some legal litigation action or something, or something else happens, and that's when the oh shit moments happens, right? And then they come in and say, you know what, how do I fix this? The uh, governance, security, um, and all of those things, ethics, bias, data bias, debiasing, none of them can be an afterthought. It got to start with the, from the get go. Mm -hmm. So you got to start at the beginning saying that, you know what, I'm going to do all of those AI programs, but before we get into this, we got to set some framework for, for doing all these things properly, mm. right? Um, and then the uh, the um, yeah. So let's so, let's let's uh, go back to the to the key points. I want to I want to bring up um, you know the cloud again. Yeah. In the, because you got to get cloud right. It, it, getting that right matters in AI to the points that you were making earlier. You can't just be out on an island. Mm -hmm. And hyperscalers, they're going to obviously continue to do well. They get more and more data is going into the cloud and they have the native tools to your point. Um, in the case of AWS, you know, Microsoft's obviously ubiquitous. Google's got great capabilities here. They've got integrated ecosystem uh, partners that are going to continue to, to, to strengthen, you know, through the decade. You know, what are your thoughts here? Um, so a couple of things. One is the the uh, the last mile mile ML or last mile AI that nobody's talking about. So that need to be attended to. That a lot of players in the market that are coming up. When I talk about last mile AI, I'm talking about you know after you are done with the experimentation of the model, how fast and quickly and efficiently can you get it to production? So that's production being compressing that, you know, that time is going to put the, dollars in your exactly, pocket. Exactly right. Yeah. So once if you got it right. If you, if you get it right, of course. So there are, there are a couple of issues with that. Once you figure out that model is working, that's perfect. People don't realize the moment you decide, that moment when the decision is made, it's like, a, as I say, it's like a new car. After you purchase, the value decreases on a minute basis. Same thing with the models. Once the model is created, you need to be in production right away because it starts losing its value on a seconds, minutes basis. So issue number one, how fast can I get it over there? So your deployment, your inferencing efficiently at the at the edge locations, your optimization, your security, all of this is an issue. But you know what is more important than that in the last mile? You keep the model up, you continue to work on, again, going back to the car analogy, at one point you got to figure out your car is costing more than to operate. So you got to get a new car, right? And that's the same thing with the models as well. If your model has come reached a stage, it is actually a potential risk for your operation to give you an idea. If you, if Uber has a model, the first time when you invite, get a car from going from point A to B, it costs you $60. If the model decayed, the next time it might give you a $40 rate. I would take it definitely, but it's lost for the company. The business risk associated with operating on a bad models. You should realize it immediately, pull the model out, retrain it, redeploy it. That's the key. And that's got to be huge in security model. Recency and security, and to the extent that you can get real time, is, is big. I mean, you, you see Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, a lot of other security companies are injecting AI. Again, they won't show up in the ETR, ML, AI taxonomy per se as a pure play, but ServiceNow is another company that you have, have mentioned to me you know, offline. AI just getting embedded everywhere. Yep. And then I'm glad you brought up you know, kind of real-time inferencing, because a lot of the modeling, if we can go back to the last point that we're going to make, in the, it, 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 a lot of the AI today is modeling done in the cloud. Mm -hmm. The other, the last point we wanted to make here, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is real-time AI inferencing, for instance, at the edge, is going to become increasingly important for us. It's, it's going to usher in new economics, new types of silicon, particularly ARM-based. We've covered that a lot on breaking analysis, new tooling, 
new companies, and that could disrupt the, the sort of cloud model if new economics emerge, because cloud obviously very centralized, they're trying to, trying to decentralize it, but, but over the course of this decade, we could see uh, some real disruption there. Andy, give us your final thoughts on that. Um, yes and no. I mean, at the end of the day, um, cloud is kind of centralized now, but a lot of these companies, including you know, AWS, is kind of trying to decentralize that by putting you know, their own <coughs> sub centers and edge locations. Local and stuff. zone, so, yeah, exactly. Outposts so, and, the, particularly yeah. the outpost concept, and if it can even become like a micro centers and stuff. It won't go to the localized level of, you know, I, I go to a single IoT level, but again, the cloud extends itself to that level. So if there is an opportunity need for it, the hyperscalers will figure out a way to fit that model. So I wouldn't too much worry about that, about deployment and, you know, where to have it and what to do with that. But, you know, figure out the right business use case, get the right data, get the ethics and governance place, and make sure that you get it to production and make sure you pull the model out when it's not operating well. Uh, excellent ad advice. Uh, Andy, I got to thank you for coming into the studio today, helping us with this breaking analysis segment. You know, outstanding collaboration and, and insights and, and input to today's episode. Hope we can do more. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. All right, I want to thank Alex Meyerson, who's on production and, and manages the podcast, Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor in chief over at Silicon Angle. He does some great editing for us. Thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com, or you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com to get in touch or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn posts. Please check out etr. AI for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. Constellation Research, Andy publishes there some awesome information on, on AI and, and data. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching everybody and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.